And you know what? I have faith in Tom. Yeah, Tom's been, like you said, just marching to the beat of his own drum, even as far back as last se- uh, in season one of Grandmasters in 2019 and season two as well, where he was just bringing this weird scarab egg plague of flame zoo warlock for like four mm. weeks in a row, even though no one else was playing this deck. And it didn't even look that good from what we were seeing on stream. But again, you've got to trust him that he's put in some kind of work or is at least seeing something that maybe we are not. Uh, and again, the other point that is just Som's biggest weakness that seems to be in stark contrast to his opponent in Samuel Sao uh. is his cool demeanor, which has just been pulling him through so consistently where even there are some lines we disagree with. He's not roping out. He's not missing lethal. And there's none of these weird little plays that other, tra- uh, none of these traps that other players are falling into. That's right. Tom, cool as a cucumber. And even though we don't always get behind what lines he ultimately goes for, I think it's always justifiable. Whereas yeah. from other players, and not just Samuel Tsao, so many times this weekend, there were errors based on just an error in mental state, I would say, getting too in your own head and not focusing on the bigger picture, which is just finishing your turn, or just it's basic things like forgetting what Zephyrus can give you at a certain time or not considering that it could give you no good options. So I think Samuel Tsao really has a lot to prove and Tom60229 is his opposite in that. I think so too. Uh, To an extent. I think they do both still have something to prove. Obviously Samuel Tsao, I think to be brutally honest, given the stiff competition that he's up against, it's getting to the point where he's proving that he deserves to be in Grandmasters because the level of play is so high. And I'm not saying that he's a bad Hearthstone player at all, but from what we've seen so far, it is not up to scratch with the rest of the GMs. Mm -hmm. Whereas Tom60229 has flown so high by winning the World Championship and becoming a Hearthstone World Champion that he has to prove that he's still up to that top, top, top tier level of play that we've seen from him previously, which I think for the most part he has, but there still just have been, like you said, those couple of blips along the way that could be ironed out in order to solidify his play. Yeah, bring up a very good point. I realized we probably haven't talked about the bands at all today, except for oh, Kin. Right. We just arrived <laughs> at, you know, such a unanimous meta outside of a couple outliers. And I can't wait to see how this is going to change or whether it even does next week, because Warriors nerfs, I feel, aren't going to affect the power level of the deck very much uh bloodsworn mercenary going down to a 2-2 from a 3-3 and blood boil brute minus one attack i feel doesn't really hit the core of the power of the deck which is being able to go off with risky skipper or buff a near immortal normal challenger i agree uh i for one however am not especially upset about that i absolutely <laughs> love warrior and i'm sad that we're not getting to see more okay. of it because it's being banned so much at the moment anyway but before we get into next week's metagame we're going to take a look at the decks for this last game of the day here in asia pacific a look at tom's decks first i believe the spell druid the very standard build of the deck here demon hunter again what we expect and the infamous galakron secret rogue here yes, rogue can't believe we've hit the point where Rogue is the deck where it's off the wall to be brought because I think Rogue for the past couple of months has just been at such an insane power level because of Galakron. And that card itself dodged the round of nerfs for next week, but what is getting hit is Shadow Jeweler Hanar going down to four health from five, getting the evil yeah. miscreant treatment, and uh, also the Blackjack Stunner now only increasing the cost of a minion one more sorry next week not now for now we're gonna see rogue at the current power level and uh to be honest that one health on hanar could make a pretty big difference if you're running up into decks like zoo it could indeed and speaking of the devil here is the zoo for samuel sal i think overall looking at his looking at his lineup it's not disastrous for rogue but it is not especially good for rogue either then being no face hunter and no druid is fantastic because i see those as two of the weakest matchups for rogue overall uh the zoo and the demon hunter i feel like in particular are very very beatable and even the highland hunter as long as it's not hitting too aggressive of a start the rogue can just lock down the board and then be uh, in a good position to go for the counter swing as rogue often does yeah, i do like the rogue versus highlander matchup zoo i think is a bit more of an outlier if, if zoo gets the hand where they're kind of just forced <laughs> to play on curve because they didn't hit the scrap imp or the hand yeah. done rogue can definitely handle that but the scrap imp turn, uh, if it's able to 
uh, be played early and go off. And then Zoo is just playing three threes, four threes, like three or four of those, one mana each. That is super problematic for Rogue. So I feel that the matchup can swing. I now that is what I call analysis 2020. Scrap <laughs> imp good, no scrap <laughs> imp bad for the Zoo. Uh, obviously, I'm being a bit sarcastic, but I agree. It's just the way the matchup goes when you're playing this Zoo deck. Sometimes it's good. And sometimes it is disastrous, as we saw for Surrender in the previous series. But the first matchup that we have here is going to be Rogue on Demon Hunter. Kind of glad that we're getting to see this right at the start. Um, because I'm, I, I think we may have been a little bit harsh on Rogue this week. It is still not a bad deck at all. It is uh, one of the top four decks, I think, in terms of overall power level. It's just where it slots in a Conquest metagame that seems to be very aggressive. But Tom here, by bringing it two weeks Oh, oh, sorry, for the second week in a row where it looked very weak. Uh, annoying use of synonyms there. Or homonyms. Homophones. It looks like it could be pretty good this week is the point I'm trying to make. That was a very interesting mulligan from Tom there because it seemed like he had pairs of cards that synergize well together. One is Pharaoh Cat into Coin Miscreant and the other one was Coin Hanar into Secret. The problem is the Coin Hanar into Secret gets shut down if Demon Hunter themselves have a very strong one-drop play into removal. It's not hard for them, uh, more so than any other class, to remove a 5 health minion that early on. So we see Tom here going for the Miscreant line. And it is going to work out very well for him. He's got plenty of ways to spend all his mana in the coming turns, especially when you factor in Edwin as well, which, I mean, a shadow step away from being insane here. With the four health total makes it just that little bit awkward for Samuel Tsao now. Yeah. He can't kill it off and develop the Overseer. So I'm just play the Overseer and ship everything face. Hmm. There's also the option, I guess, to go Sightless Watcher and buff. And then he could go Overseer Hero Power next turn. And probably have enough mana. Okay, I like this. Or, or even does he go for Overseer Sidekick next turn and go for the Hero Power this turn? To just fully take out the Miscreant, I think, is a line I quite like the look of. It's just the timing of when you get rid of your 1-1s is a little bit awkward. Because at this point, Rogue probably wants to play Seal Fade. And if you've conveniently given them one minion served up on a platter, I'm not too sure. I like this line. Uh, I can see your point that it is vulnerable to uh, a seal fate from your opponent, but even then, the answers on the following turn to a Sator Overseer at full health are somewhat limited. There's a chance that they can't kill it off. True enough. I guess this is a load the other of rubbish. point... Yeah. The Plague of Madness overrides the Umbra way. <laughs> Whoa. Now that's what I call value. He takes it anyway, just for a way to clear off this 2-2 immediately. Alright, saved just to deal with a bigger minion later on, I suppose. Yeah, I like this a lot from Tom. There was the temptation there to go for Shadow Step the Witchy Lackey to get a good 3-drop. But by going for the uh, Praise Galakrond instead, he gets a Lackey, keeps the Shadow Step, and sets up for an 8-8 Edwin on the following turn, and gets a premium Lackey to go along with that. And a premium target for that, oh. assuming that Samuel Tsao buffs up the Sixpater over here. Now it's not so cut and dry, because he could buff up the Sightless Watcher to take a True. value trade. No matter which way it, he goes, though, the Kobold Lackey will make quick work of the board. Yeah, the effect is the same. Uh, obviously not from Samuel Sal's perspective. It needs to consider other cards uh, that can be used here from the rogue side. I think I'm thinking of, therefore, the crazed maniac. Or, uh, sorry, devoted maniac. Which means you would want to buff the... Sata Overseer. And then mm. take a 3-2 into 2-1 trade. I yeah. think it's quite ugly no matter which way you slice it. So I think True. this play from Samuel Tsao, which is just not respecting removal from Tom and works out better in every other situation, works out. That's fair. Yep, yeah, like we said, it works out the same either way with this line where he is met with a heckin' big Edwin ready to start the counter pressure. And this is mm -hmm. the way 
that Rogue swings back the matchup. They take a bit of damage in the early game. Usually, Tom hasn't actually taken any here at all. Oh. And then they just start killing their opponent very quickly. How oh, very true. And Samuel Tsao, of course, you don't want to be playing Metamorphosis when you can't immediately mm. activate it. But the alternative here is Kane, which oh, lines up so complete. poorly against Edwin. Ah. He's even preemptively damaging it. Making sure that should a taunt come down, and it has, you can still ping off the Edwin. Although, if you're going to be playing Kane, I'm not sure if he... Uh, okay, it's not just taunts, it's just removal for the minions he had on yeah, board. Yeah. Makes sense. And now I guess we are looking at Kane, just because it's the best way to spend your mana, or would you prefer Sightless Watcher to manipulate the top card of your deck? Hmm. Um, I think it would probably still be Kane to get rid of the Lackey. It just lines yeah. up so poorly against it the Shield of Galakron. Really does. The Plays around Togwaggle with this line as well. Yes, that's a big one. And the other thing is, if you play Sightless Watcher Umberwing, that also lines up poorly into Lackey. Plus Dagger being able to get sure. into Nightless Watcher, etc. Looking at the Glaives. Honestly, I'm just looking at Blazing Battle Mage. Yeah, like, just because okay. it's the cheapest yeah. card. And he's playing Skull next turn anyway. It's true. You could just slot that in. Yeah. I think he's just taken way too much damage to oh! be looking at these. Oh, the War Glaives. But the Aaron off the top. Tom, you're a madman. It's the Samuel's direct punish expression. from Samuel's line. <laughs> it really is. But to be fair, I don't think he could really afford to be playing around Tog. Because he's been so far behind already. And yeah, if Tog yeah, yeah. comes down, whether it's this turn or next, he's just not getting back into this. Crazy. Well, we've got a board clear. Yes. At the very least. And he's got to take four damage in the process. This is a big ol' yikes. Yeah, looking beyond miserable. But thankfully for Samuel Sal, this is the modern build of Rogue that is significantly lower in terms of the uh, burst damage that it can meter out, particularly uh, because of Edwin Bank. Uh, sorry, Leroy Jenkins leaving the meta and going to the Hall of Fame means that Tom is probably relying on still sticking a board of some kind, unless he can hit the Galakrond into Kronk's nonsense. Sticking a board doesn't sound like a very difficult proposition at all when he's got yeah. the wand. This is good enough! Anar, Miscreant. Yeah, even a Blackjack Stunner seems pretty insane. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was a little bit... Samuel's cho choice not to play Twin Slice there, preserve his 1-1. One, one. Yeah. You might be thinking the only way he ever swings back is Altruist, so he wants as many zero-cost spells as possible, whereas the 1-1 one, one wasn't really helping a game plan overall. But to be honest, I don't see a game plan that gets there for Samuel Tso, given that he hasn't been able to even scratch Tom. <laughs> Alright, have more lackeys. drop as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So of course this means that uh, the Blackjack Stunner is no longer playable on this turn, but it seems like Tom is holding back it on the Hanar anyway to set up for a stronger turn of value. It, he could have just gone Ambush Stunner without Hanar. Oh, sure, sure, sorry, of course. Although, uh, but that deactivates, <laughs> yeah. Hanar for next turn, sure. Yeah. Alas, poor warlock. Not a very big deal in the grand scheme of things. Of course. Are you? There you have it, Tom 1-0 with the deck that everybody was hating on for this week. Just absolutely flying into a victory there. And it's got to be said, against a fairly respectable starting hand as well uh, from Samuel Sao. But it was just through a very disciplined start to the early game where, like I said, he got a very bad outcome off the Witchy Lackey. Didn't let that rumble him, though. He just made the two two ones on board kept the Shadow Step, got a great lackey, and the Edwin alone was pretty much just what propelled him to victory there. Edwin plus Kobold. 
plus Shadow Step. Those three cards together were very, very important. But I also want to highlight the Mulligan from Tom. A lot of the times you can feel tempted to keep Hanar into secret, but given that he already had a powerful one into two curve, or rather one into coin three, I think it was yep. disciplined of him to toss those in search of something better, got the Edwin, and just took it from there. Very much agree. It can look like Tom isn't really thinking about it because he just seems so relaxed, but it's when you see stuff like that that you realize it's just all going through his head so quickly. It looks like so easy when he does mm -hmm. it, but truly a master in action that we are seeing here. And we will get to see more of him after this short break with the conclusion of the final series of the day here. Tom60229 versus Samuel Sow after this. You're joining us for the final series of Asia Pacific for today. It is Tom60229 
versus Samuel Sal. But fear not if you've just joined us. Plenty more Hearthstone action to come today with Europe and America's shortly after. But for now, Gia, we are in with a battle of the uh, the top versus the bottom of Division B yet again. Samuel Sal, despite only having played two matches, given that he only played one match during the first week, has lost both of them. They were both very, very close. I believe going all the way up to Game 5 uh, versus uh, Tyler in Week 1 and then coming right up to the wire yesterday as well. But now he is in with a chance of turning things around, even though he is one game down versus Tom. That's right. For Samuel Tsao, yesterday I was impressed with his warrior play very much Same. so, especially since it's a deck that people have been banning so often that you don't expect to get it left up. And it was against Blitzchung in particular that Samuel Tsao managed to take a win with his warrior. However, we did see him blunder in several moments um, not just this week, but weeks prior. And I think he's really, really got to tie it together, even though he seems to be bringing a pretty you good lineup every week. If the play is me. not up to par, it can't just be one thing or the other. He does, of course, have the opportunity still to turn this around, not only in this game, but in the rest of GM. We're talking about how every match matters, but just the difference between getting games, uh, finishing seventh and finishing sixth going for automatic relegation versus playing a relegation bracket. A couple of wins from Samuel Sal could definitely put him above the rest of the pack uh, in terms of Dawn and Frosty in particular, right down there at the bottom at 0-3. Feels like we might have not a direct repeat, but an echoing back of the situation from last year's Grandmasters where it seemed like it was just a few players fighting for those relegation spots. It's just different now that all of them are in the same division, um, at least for the two guaranteed relegation spots, and that there are two to begin with that are automatic and a third one. Yeah, great point. Interesting starting play there by Tom to just use up a twin slice, obviously to get the outcast and the draw on the Crimson Sigil Runner. I don't even think that's necessarily an automatic play. You could definitely just hold on to it for a turn there because you don't have to play the Crimson Sigil Runner on one, sorry, given how vulnerable it is to just the hero power. But at the very least, it eats up some mana from Samuel Tsao on this turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could also make the argument that because Tom has Umber Wings, saving both charges of Twin Slice kind of sets him up for a good reactive game plan. Yeah. Despite being the player going first. But I think the fact that because he is going first, it incentivizes him just that little bit more to be the first to put Azeroth on board. Because the Demon Hunter mirror tends to swing back every turn, back and forth. Well, Samuel Sao has undeniably got himself a very, very powerful hand here in terms of all the one-drops. The perfect curve into Sita Overseer as well. But again, Gia, Tom60229, double Frozen Shadow Weaver. I don't think it would be ridiculous to call him in the lead here. I got you, friend. I mean, also this strange interplay that Samuel Tsao really wants to be using a weapon charge this turn to clear off every minion. So he's just giving up the weapon anyway. And in a weird Ravenism, roundabout way, the <laughs> Seder Overseer won't actually be locked out by the Frozen it's Shadow Weaver this turn. Because I don't think Samuel Tsao was planning on playing it anyway. I mean, if he was expecting the Frozen Shadow Weaver on three, this is a great play around it from Samuel Sao. Is it I don't even know if it's necessarily expecting that, but it's a great side benefit. Right. Because the development of a 2-4 Battle Fiend is extremely strong there. Does, of course, mean here that Tom is still able to get a lot of this benefit out of the Frozen me. Shadow Weaver, showing just how incredibly powerful it is Whoa. in the matchup. Because the Battle Fiend does not trade well, even with Samuel Sao getting a pretty nutty couple of draws. Do you know what? With these types of draws, he does not need to trade whatsoever. The Frozen Shadow Weaver one, uh, takes a VT into the Battle Fiend. Sure, Samuel Sao just then, from his perspective, goes Seder, hero power it down. Tom, however, has the second Shadow Weaver and can also play I-Beam if he wants to get rid of the Blazing Battle Mage. At that point, though, he might be freezing a minion over Samuel Sao's face. Hmm. I think you're still freezing face here. I, I think it's just too scary. Because e every good play that isn't exactly Kane, I, I feel like, involves attacking with the face. A counterpoint. 
what if you save it for going into turn 5, which is another really great turn to be that freezing the opponent. Definitely listen to that, yeah. They will never catch me. It's just that the turn from Tom is still very strong despite not using uh, the Frozen Shadow Weaver. He gets to clear yep. off a bunch of minions, redevelop an Underwing, and then save the freeze going into Warglaves slash Slavebound Adapter. <laughs> yeah, you pulled me around here. This feels very, very strong. Oh, twin look at slice the twin as, slice well. as well. <laughs> oh, the Shadow Weaver is going to be so clutch here for Tom because he saved it. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the Sigil Runner into Frozen Shadow Weaver, or into the opposing Sigil Runner, yeah. and sidekick into one of the... What do you even call this token? Umber Wings? <laughs> I have no idea. Demons? Flying Demons? Ah, uh, Felwings. That makes sense. Uh, Non-frenzied. The mysteries of Hearthstone. <laughs> <laughs> Just regular so Felwings. Fel <laughs> <laughs> I like my terminology better. Alright, jokes Ooh. aside now, Gia. It's Hearthstone time. Look at that draw. That is a tough choice for Tom60229 to make now. We always say, he who wave bounds last, wave bounds the hardest. Or also exactly. the last. But the thing is, for Tom, he doesn't see a weapon equipped here, so yeah. he's thinking Samuel Sao needs to have this combination of cards also to keep the swing, a Twin Slice and Glaivebound Adept. So I think it's reasonable for Tom to go for it here, but unfortunately for him, Samuel Sao's got the answer. If he even wants to go for it, he could even just go Warglaive's Twin Slice this turn. But I quite like the development. Me too. Uh, this... <sighs> The I kind of benefit you get out of Warglaves is that you can set up for a huge Sator Overseer to go really wide on the following turn. But honestly, I'd just rather get a 6-4 in play. It's so powerful here. No matter which way he orders it, the freeze is going to be very annoying for Samuel Tau. But I think <laughs> it's more annoying if he doesn't have a minion on board. Because then the Warglaves get stuck. Then he can't even activate the Glaivebound battle cry. So he's going to exactly. go for it now, and then even though he won't be able to attack with a weapon into the freeze, he'll have the 6-4 on board. And in a weird roundabout kind of way, Gia, this does... Oof, I was going to say still work out well for Tom on average after the freeze, but with Skull off the top, he just instantly foregoes that anyway, and the entire game plan flips on his head. And we see Samuel Sao assume the Tom position of the hand-to-hand -hand <laughs> head, but this is a very tax now. This one is more in <laughs> aggravation. <laughs> but you know what? Oh, using his opponent's spot. power against him. <laughs> not in a bad spot. He gets to take this face attack with the glaive yeah. bound. It's a bit scary because you've seen your opponent's skull up, so you're going to have to brace for I a big swing. Impatient. And therefore, do you not develop the board and instead just go warglaive swing face? Um... It's tough to say because the swing could come in many different forms, right? The altruist swing obviously rewards you for equipping weapon yeah. over than playing minions. But the free oh. swing, or both, <laughs> I guess. Gosh. Yeah, that's true, actually. I wasn't even thinking freeze as well. I was thinking metamorphosis as well. Whoa. Oh, okay. It's close, it's isn't actually it? actually really tough to parse this because... Um, the Altruist is one card Demons. short of being able to clear the Glaive Bound. Yeah. And you don't really want to use the Glaive Bound because there's a War Glaives equipped. Yeah. So maybe it doesn't all happen this turn. We could be looking at Metamorphosis, shoot the Glaive Bound, free space. Is okay. too slow? No, I don't think so. I think that sets up for a much stronger Altruist potentially on the following Demons. turn. Because yeah. it Demons. feels like at the moment, unless they hit exactly Metamorphosis, they're not killing you quick enough. To the point where Altruis is useless. Mm -hmm. Oh, if he's going at for it this way, he has to hero power first, right? The regular hero power. Yep. Yeah. Okay, very clean. Now I am complete. Oh, even commits the, uh, the battle fiend here, since he's attacking anyway. So... I actually like this from Tom, as opposed to the situation from Chansu. Tom is not present race for lethal. He 
probably needs to get in some minion attacks. So he's saying that if I stick this Battle Fiend, it is more damage than it potentially could have done as an Altruist proc. Agreed. And the only way to kill it off really is I beam And if it targets that, it's not targeting the Shadow Weaver anyway. So it's just kind of free development onto the board. Uh, obviously, the only punish is a huge Altruist, but that seems unlikely at this point, given that he knows that one of the cards is a second slice. Indeed. Once again, Frozen Shadow Weaver negating the vast majority of Samuel Tao's ideal plays. I grow impatient. Probably take the spectral sight. Same. This the rest of this turn is just so depressing though. Time grows short. Imagine I... Glacial Shard is back in the meta. It just replaces Crimson Sigil Runner right after the nerf. <laughs> Demons. That'd be pretty nuts forever. actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, we can see Tom Ooh. pop off see this turn. Oh, yes. Like but, that. But are we playing hey. question? Because that would forego him being able to use the metamorphosis. Of course, start with the draw and evaluate from there. I think he's still Kane. You can just go with it next turn, right? It's not that much of a sacrifice. Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, given that it's not lethal either way, the Kane potentially yes. gets in one extra damage than one shot of the hero power anyway. Very clean. And... A lot of damage, but not enough to heal out of range. Yeah, it's just not coming close. He does not have lethal, even with all the uh, slicey YCs. He's got a way to deal with Altruist, yeah, but everything else... That dies is also dealing Samuel Tao damage if he sinks the Warglaives into it. So no way out. He can even see the hero power, and that will be a quick 2-0 in Tom's favor. Very, very nicely done as well. There were a couple of really weird choices in the mid-game with Tom specifically about how he utilized the frozen shadow weavers. But I think the real genius stroke was holding it back on turn four, as you pointed out, saving it for the crucial turn five. As it just so happens, he didn't go for it anyway, uh, I think, with the uh, skull off the top anyway. But it was still, uh, I think, a very good play around what Samus was likely to do. He had the glaive bound off the top, and that got glaive exactly. bound and down. Right. But then the freeze prevented the responding um, war glaives. It is just so back and forth in the Demon Hunter mirrors until the last few turns when one player just puts the other under that crucial health total, I would say 12 to 10 to 12 is where you just have to start respecting from hand lethal potential from Demon Hunter. And that's time when if you, you spend too much resources dealing with their board, there is just no coming back. Yeah, it is just that one missed turn of development, removal, whatever it may be that you need on that turn. And the game just instantly ends. And that's exactly what Frozen Shadow Weaver offered to Tom, even though it came down much later than expected. Freezing the uh, weapons just meant, like we saw in that disastrous second to last turn from Samuel Sal, there was nothing he could do. But now, the Druid as the only remaining deck for Tom. Are we still liking his chances here? Obviously, he's 2-1 up, so he kind of has to be in the lead. But I would argue he's got three bad matchups left over. Well, this brings up, I think, the ban philosophy we were talking about from mm. Blitzchung and Kin, where they seem to be banning out decks to make sure that all of their decks have at least one remaining decent matchup. Whereas, personally, the way I approach Conquest is banning the overall deck from the opponent that has win rates. And though, even though you get stuck on, say, a Druid, in this case, the for Tom, the one that is least likely to have a good matchup, if you have three shots on it, I think it's still absolutely fine, especially when Druid, by the nature of the deck, can get those unbeatable draws. But already we're seeing a difference in how Tom approaches the Druid versus Zoo matchup compared to Alutemu. He's kept the crystal power in the opener. Yeah, exactly. This is the antithesis of what we've seen from the Japanese players, which is all in on the win condition right from the mulligan. And to be honest, I prefer that game plan. I think up against the best cases, if it is the decent scenario from the zoo, the Wrath is just not what you should be going for. Early pressure is not what you're afraid of. Yeah, crystal power probably... 
I would agree. There's just not that much to be scared of. And taking a look at the list from Samuel Tao, it's not even got Flame Imps, which is, I would say, the one argument you could make an argument for keeping Crystal Power for. I suppose the difference is that here, Tom is on the coin and had more cards to mulligan with versus Alutamu was on the play during mm -hmm. that one game. But I still think so even good. in this position, Alutamu would have tossed Crystal Power along with the other Japanese players who have been bringing Druid since the beginning. And the the punish is here, you know, I'm not trying to be too results oriented here, but this kind of hand is more likely to occur for Tom when he's holding onto the removal spells in hand. Obviously, this is pretty much a disaster where you have no proactive plays at all, be it wild growth, overgrowth, um, or the glow flight, ideally, in order to just develop mm -hmm. the board. The Mount Cellar is at least something to work towards, but it is a long ways off, Gia. Yep. And we already see him expending Wrath for to get something proactive. Fungal Fortunes definitely helps. Yeah. And he's gonna go for it as early as now. I like this. Can't be wasting too much time playing Crystal Power onto minions. Yeah, it gives him a few good draws. Oh, Overgrowth yeah. is a big one, and Innovate Glowfly was the other power play he could be moving towards. True enough. And we were talking about how Zoo a lot of the time is not actually developing so much pressure in the early game, but this feels like one of the matchups where to barely have to play for the scrap imp hands, especially mm. if you, this build from Samuel Tell that's running Serpent Eggs, which is just a decent sized minion, especially when you have the evil genius as he did to proc it as early as now. Canrath had another card that's not an auto include in Zoo, despite us thinking that this is just like Mech Warper, it's gotta be insane, right? Yeah, very far from an auto include. I think a lot of players expecting a lot of Demon Hunter cut the Flame Imps, and when you've cut the Flame Imps, the benefit of Canrath goes down quite drastically. But it is the most pressure he can put on the board on this turn. Uh, obviously equal to uh, the three damage he could put on any other way. Tom's list for Druid is not running Starfall, so I don't think this is any risk at all from Samuel Sao to commit wider board. Yep, there is one line and one line only for Tom, and it is overgrowth mm -hmm. into the most busted Mount Cellar turn you have ever seen in your ding dang life next turn. Mm -hmm. And knowing Tom, it will be just that. I saw four <laughs> Messenger Ravens a while ago. I'm ready yep. for four Diving Griffins there. Or some combination of Mooklas and Diving Griffins. I will accept that as well to be on par with Tom's standards. But he is actually, to respect the Canrathad, still has four spells available for next turn. Wild Griffins it. could not have torn me away from going Innovate plus the Crystal Power on turn 7. <laughs> I'm a greedy gamer though. It, 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 I don't know. To be honest, I'm, I'm not actually convinced this is the right way to go around it. I guess it plays better around Soulfire, being able to go over the top of the taunts. Right. I mean, Tsao was showing... He's already showing 8 on board, so it was 11 had the counter thought been left there. Uh, yeah. And um, if you don't actually roll more than one taunt, I mean, one will be coming off of the Iron Bark, of course. Yep. Suddenly it gets very scary to be potentially taking six more damage over those two turns. So, Gia, would you like to know some fun stats about, ex about Exotic Mount Cellar? I would. I do realize I misspoke a while ago. It is 15 three cost speeds, not 16. Right. And uh, the chance of getting a taunt, given he's summoning four minions, most likely, is just under, uh, sorry, is, uh, just under a quarter. It's 24% chance that we end up with one taunt, at least. So not that bad, feels like, the way I see it. That feels like lower than it has been, but we are getting to see some of the worst beasts in the game. What? Oy, These are oy, consistently oy. terrible from Tom. Oh my gosh, and finally Whoa. a reaction from Tom. They're all two health and below. That's... what? Is that just game? He can rush in so many minions here. Yeah, I Cobalt think is it four, looks like game. Seven, nine. He can generate more lackeys as well. Yeah. It's just whether or not he has the mana to do so. so. so no, 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 you want to sacrifice something first, first right? Uh, okay. Um... I think this is good because if you get Rush Lackey, then you want to rush in the Evil Genius. 
Sure, okay. And then also another Cobalt is better. Not quite the premium ones for Samuel Sao, but this is still so much damage, even if it's not lethal. He can trade down the board and Thomas just summoned the menagerie of the worst beasts. Jeez, that's worse than four messenger ravens. <laughs> Significantly so. wrap my head around it. How unlucky do you have to be to hit? I think these are just the four worst beasts in the pool. Can't think of anything worse. Yeah, one after another. There's no like ones that have negative effects. It's just bad stats if the only thing you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Ooh, but that is a very good effect there to get. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yikes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're looking at he missed some damage to face because he, of course, could have rushed in with the uh -huh. witchy lackey there. But in the end, none of that matters. Extremely bad beats for Tom there, but it is not that big of a deal, I want to say, because the Druid still has two shots. But as you brought up a while ago, it's bad matchups across the board for old Malfurion. It is. There are a couple of things I really like that you brought up, though. Number one, the mulligan. So different from what we've been seeing from the players who have been having success with the Druid. Primarily the Japanese players and also Rivius springs to mind as one of the key innovators of the Druid archetype here in APAC GM. And also I think that just uh, from Samuel Sao's side, having a hand without Imp usually spells disaster, to be honest. But he did a great job of just piling on the pressure as quickly as he possibly could and saving the carpet for just the right time where it wasn't vulnerable to removal, but still came in just at the right time to allow him to sweep through the Mount Cellar. The build of Zoo is worth noting from Samuel Tsao, which overall, I don't really like the inclusion of Serpent Egg these days. I think it's far too slow against, mm. say, Demon Hunters, which you're probably leaving up if you're banning Warrior. But against Druid in particular, the Egg can present a way to curve out enough damage in the early game to try and seal it towards the end there. But now, Samuel Tsao is going to be playing the premium deck in the meta. Demon Hunter, and we're gonna see another crossroads for Tom, whether he thinks Crystal Power is worth keeping. And if there's a matchup where you would keep it, I think the argument for it against Demon Hunter than for Zoo. I absolutely agree. If we're looking at the power of a even a Battle Fiend, now it's been nerfed, the threat is significantly diminished, more so than you might expect. But it's still just so scary. Sata Overseer as well, way too scary. You need an answer for that. We see the three keep as well. Overgrowth, I definitely get behind. The Innervate is a very hopeful keep, I would say. You get heavily rewarded if you survive to, say, go Overgrowth into Innervate Mount Cellar or coin Overgrowth into Blowfly. Yep. And he just has all the ramp in the world now. But does this actually come together if he's not drawing Fungal Fortunes to give him more spells? That's right, he doesn't need mana, he needs cards at the moment in order to activate the Glowfly, or of course, the draw of the exotic Mount Cellar to ramp into, because when you're keeping an Innovate and you're hitting that hand, that sounds insane. There's another line, because the first one that sprung up to my thoughts was coin Wild Growth into Overgrowth, mm -hmm. and then go for the Glowfly. There's a way he saves spells by just hero powering this turn. Wild Growth next turn, we'll fly the turn after. He's obviously been given a very easy hero, or very decent hero power for this point in the right. game. The problem, of course, then becomes that if he does want to go for that, he's not answering a Sator Overseer. Mm -hmm. He could, of course, deviate on turn three with Wild Growth Coin Crystal power, but then you're running into the same problem of being very low on spells. No yeah. One. Again, it goes back to how awkward the keep of crystal power makes things. Sometimes yeah. you don't even want it in the hand, so you're not tempted to use it for removal. Because a lot of the time, Druid is all or nothing. But Tom here is saying, let me use three spells this and get Glowfly for approximately four minions is the most likely outcome next turn. It seems like it, unless we see some spicy draws off the top to turn things around. Like exactly Fungal Fortunes. So the play I was suggesting, of course, would have been far too slow to deal with what Samuel Sao has on board. But the way I see it, Glowfly for four um, flies isn't even that good either. Now it's a change of plan though, right? We are going Wild mm -hmm. Growth, take out the Yosei Overseer. Right. 
And Overflow just looks nuts here. Yes, it really does. I'm just gonna get the bad news that the second Sator is there alongside Battle <laughs> That is just premium refill into a turn. The only thing that Samuel Sal missed was a one drop on one. Outside of that, this has just been the best possible anti druid hand. Agreed. But Tom has good draws from Overflow. Bog Beam could be huge. Oh, yes. And eventually a Mount Cellar. He's bought himself a little bit Whoa. of time with this. There's a Mount Cellar, there's a Bog Beam. Oh, they're great. Okay. Tom could be turning oh, okay. the corner. There's another Bog Beam, but I think, yes, you absolutely hold on to it. It's got another shot with Beasts. And you know what? I'm feeling it for Tom this time. No more Desert Hairs, Derek. <laughs> Only Griff Griffos. I mean, anything. Even if he gets the bad ones, it's still good enough, I think, here, because he can just buff them up with the power of the wild. The main thing he's just looking for here, more than anything else. I mean, I guess taunts. Griffins, but really Taunts is yes. what he wants. Yeah. Agreed, agreed, agreed. So he's got um, three shots at around 25%. Uh, 18.7, to be precise. Creatures. All right, there First you go. First one. Whoa. Not bad either. Curious whether he wants to innervate purely for another beast. I think because he's got enough mana to play the power cards next turn, it's fine. There you have it. Tom's beasts are cooperating this game. Samuel Zhao, definitely not out of juice, the skull. Could help him transition into a burst game plan. I don't think he's winning the board back, but Metamorph. Even the Sightless Watcher, this is a very wow. unfashionable inclusion. But on this turn, it is going to be incredibly powerful. The War Glaives! The next turn, huge. He just transitions, right? At this mm -hmm. point, you're not dealing with the Mount Cellar. He can, I think, get a little bit of face damage in after going through the Ironford Grizzlies. And he absolutely needs to. Right now, the game plan is race the druid. Yeah. Tom has used two crystal powers, I believe. Overflow, the healing is very limited now. But just look at what he can do in terms of these spells. There are going to be so many beasts generated. There are. But it's all about the taunts. Can he roll the other taunts? Can he draw his iron mark? I've double checked it, Daryl. No chance for strange out of nowhere lethals this turn. <laughs> so we start well, with the Wrath Cycle. Perhaps? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's either Wrath or Glowflow is two options. And he just gets another Grizzly. Oh my, okay. I think Tom kind of deserves this after the terrible quality of his beasts last game. Okay, you know what? I want to say thanks, Lorinda, for compiling a Mount Cellar odds chart, but can we get a separate Tom 60229 one? Because this is clearly broken. <laughs> because he gets another one! Hello? And the trade is absolutely fine because he's just set up for lethal anyway. With the next turn, Savage Roar, Power of the Wild. I think, let's jump. I mean, Samuel Sao is healing out of this one. Can the Warglaves take out enough damage? Hmm. So he can remove four minions completely off the uh, two slots off the board. Let's call it that. Right. And I beam another it, with his hero power. I think it probably becomes five <laughs> slots that he can clear up totally. Sorry, sorry, three slots. Three slots. Six yes. minions. Yes. <laughs> but even then, if he's not dead, he he may as well be. Yeah taking so much damage in the process to do that. Even three slots, he's just dead with four minions remaining. <sighs> Ghost not even going for the hero power. I think this line is fine from Samuel Sao. He's saying, if you have the roar, you can me. So I'm making the best play towards yeah. my own win condition. And we're gonna see Tom take it in a very tense game four.
Have the graphics already been updated on the side to put Samuel Sao down to 0 and 3 before he's even lost the game? Supreme well. BM coming in the, from the producers here, but I think we can both agree that is going to be it. And Samuel Sao has yet to win a game, or a series, I should say, sorry, on stream for Hearthstone Grandmasters. This one was the least close out of all of them. We've only seen him three times given his terrible run through the Swiss, and he's just gone on to lose all three of his matches so far. It breaks my heart to see. It is looking very, very scary for Samuel Tsao down at the bottom there. But let's not let that take away from Tom's oh, yes. hot streak. That means he himself goes up to 3 and 0, oh, really proving that he is world championship material. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be great to see Tom make another run to playoffs and then to another global finals? If anyone in Division B is going to do it, I really believe that Tom60229 is the uh, prime candidate in order to do so. Fantastic start, showing very great consistency and level-headedness across the board. And again, for Division B, the top four players get to fight out for the last two slots in the eight players that go to playoffs overall, along with the top six of Division A. So it's unlikely that he gets through there, even if he finishes very, very well. But it is a real possibility for Tom60229. That's right. And that does mean that we have three players up to three of recall over in division b there's tom and blitzchung and in division a glory the man of the hour really at this point i am honestly not sure because it just does uh, sorry it does just look like his preparation is too strong we're seeing consistently strong play on the druid i'm still just not a fan of the deck in the metagame but maybe that's because i'm playing it badly i don't appreciate the power that the players who have been grinding out games with it are able to bring with the table, uh, to bring to the table. Sorry, uh, I think we can take a look at the standings now to see how things shape out, or at the very least, the schedule for today's matches to see how things shook out overall with today's craziness. And here it is. Thank you so much. Like you said, three players at three and zero all together. But most importantly for me, there's a real race starting to form, Gia, where Frosty Dawn and Samuel Sau are just fighting tooth and nail to not be in seventh and eighth at the end of this season and get automatically relegated yeah if you round up this is already halfway through the matches that mm. they have to play and it's just getting so scary at this point they need to win every single match remaining just to have a positive record four and three and that is probably safe enough to not be seventh and eighth but if you have that mindset where i absolutely cannot lose any other series yeah. Imagine just how much pressure that puts more on these players, and we've already been seeing some stress-related breakdowns. I absolutely agree. It's been the bane of Dawn. Frosty, even though it wasn't so much stress, it was just the fact that he roped out. That's still a part of it. If you're taking longer to make your plays than usual because of the high-pressure situation and how much weight is put on these matches, it's still something you've got to sort out heading into the next games. And we saw it again from Chonsu, who went down 0-3 as well today, not being able to kill off the Mount Cellar. It's just the biggest problem for these players. Yeah, Chonsu, I think a little bit uncharacteristic of him. We've seen him be a little bit more sloppy recently than I would expect. Yep. But it is scary over in Division A as well for Chonsu and Kin, because despite them being in the top half of players, if you finish 7th or 8th in Division A, you will be part of that allegation bracket up against 5th and 6th from Division B to determine who is potentially the third relegation spot for this going to be very exciting stuff cannot wait to see that one played out by these players but for now we are all done with our day two of asia pacific we have four games for you coming tomorrow of course to find out the last few players where they sit in the division tables but now it is time for europe with raven and soul so unless you have anything final to add to about today's action gear i'm going to send us over Oh, nothing. But today was, oh, yesterday was frozen. Today is frozen too. And tomorrow will be frazzled. <laughs> frazzled. Exactly. I cannot wait for, um, I don't even know what the songs could be. I'll try and think of a hilarious joke for tomorrow's stream. But for now, we'll send you over to the much more quick-witted Raven and Sottle with Europe. Enjoy.